True Crime Brewery contains disturbing content related to real-life crimes. Medical information is opinion based on facts of a crime and should not be interpreted as medical advice or treatment. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome to True Crime Brewery. I'm Jill. And I'm Dick. On November 10th, 2010, in broad daylight, a man broke into the home of Tina Herrmann and her two young children. The attacks, murders, and kidnapping that followed were some of the worst crimes in the history of the state of Ohio. Matthew Hoffman was known by his neighbors as a bit of an oddball, but this didn't necessarily mean that he was dangerous. He did have a history of breaking and entering that put him in prison once, but he didn't appear to be a violent person. Then, in 2010, Hoffman's odd behavior began to escalate. Join us at the quiet end for House of Leaves. Tina was a working mother determined to give her son and daughter a stable, safe, and loving home. Despite not having much money, she'd been successful with this, but Tina had no way of knowing that her home had become the target of an increasingly disturbed Hoffman. When Tina didn't show up for work on November 11th, the scene inside her house pointed to unspeakable violence. And when the police entered Hoffman's home, what they saw inside was unlike anything they'd ever seen before. Just a real horror show. Yeah, it sounded like just some horrific stuff. Absolutely. So what kind of a beer can you give me to kind of numb my pain with this case? Well, I picked an IPA for you. This is Headhunter from Fathead's Brewery in North Olmsted, Ohio. Pretty good beer. Headhunter is, uh, I guess, the flagship beer for Fathead's Brewery. So it's a, a gold. It's got a thick ivory head, some moderate amount of lace, nice aroma, crusty white bread, taste of some nice hop bitterness, caramel, and crusty bread. Mm. It's got a dry finish. So it is, it is a, a bitter. It's more of a West Coast IPA. Very nice. All right. Well, you know, it's a super hot day, so I think any beer would be refreshing at this point. Yeah, I probably should have picked a Mexican lager or something like that. But yeah, this will work. Well, we're not in Mexico for this crime, though. I know. Okay. All right. Well, let's open it up. Got it. Okay, come on down to the quiet end. They've got a window open and a fan on, so hopefully we'll stay cool and it won't be too noisy. Yeah, but you know, it's pretty hot. Yeah, it's over 100. Yeah, once again. So, global warming. How'd you get me to move here anyway? Uh, You said you didn't want to shovel snow anymore. I see. So you haven't shoveled any snow since we moved to New Mexico, have you? You got me there. All right. I haven't shoveled snow. (laughs) Nor have I mowed a lawn or raked the leaves. That's right. And you can golf year-round. So? So no bitching. Okay. Now I know why we moved here. Okay. Why don't you get us started on this case? It might be kind of a long one because there's a lot to talk about, but that's okay. I've got time. Me too. So Tina Herrmann met Larry Maynard when they were teenagers in Reynoldsburg, Ohio. They went to different high schools, but after they had met, they spent time together every chance they got. They liked to ride bikes, go out for burgers, see movies. Tina even liked to watch Larry play basketball. That's a good girlfriend. I tell you. Now, they both came from working class homes, and Tina and Larry developed a strong work ethic early on. Larry worked for his grandfather's house painting business. Tina took a job at Kmart. And after they graduated high school, they moved to an apartment building together outside of Columbus. They were in love and planning their futures together. So it all seems pretty good. So far, so good. Now, when they were both 19 years old in 1997, Tina gave birth to their daughter, Sarah. Sarah was born six weeks early and she weighed less than five pounds, but she was actually a really hardy baby who gained weight and caught up to meet all of her milestones. Needless to say, Tina and Larry adored their daughter. She was a pretty baby who smiled easily. Two years after Sarah's birth, the couple had a son, and they named him Cody. 
Like his sister, Cody was also born premature and small, but just like Sarah, he developed into a really happy, healthy baby. So Sarah and Cody were energetic, happy kids, and they were pretty close, playing games and riding bikes together on weekends. Their lives weren't always easy as the family lived from paycheck to paycheck, but the children had everything they really needed. According to her friends and family members, Tina made sure of that. She would work as many hours, as many jobs as needed, just to make sure they were provided for. Yeah, and now with this growing family to support, Larry was always looking for better paying jobs. But his options were limited since he didn't have a college education. He was determined to provide a comfortable life for his children. So he looked around and he learned that one of the best paying jobs he could qualify for was as a long haul truck driver. Work sounded good. And he liked the idea of getting behind the wheel of a big truck and the freedom of the open road. Larry knew he could be a successful long haul trucker. But there was one problem. Even though the money was a big improvement, he was going to spend a lot of time away from his family. And he didn't like that. I mean, we're talking weeks at a time. Oh, yeah. But he talked it over with Tina, and the two of them decided that the sacrifice would be worth the increased pay and benefits. So Larry began driving all over the country. His company's headquarters was in Florida, and Larry hauled flowers and plants to florist shops. And sometimes he would be gone for six to eight weeks at a time. And with time, this got to be pretty stressful for Tina. And she's working in a grocery store and was, for all intents and purposes, a single mom. Yeah, it had to be rough. To me, driving a truck doesn't sound so great because I don't like to drive. But some people do, and it does pay well. It does, and then I can see all the, the arguments, and I can see them saying, this sounds like a good deal, we can get, we can do this. But they were only, what, early 20s, they were just kids, so yeah. what sounded good at one point, maybe six months down the road, isn't so good when reality sets in. Right, it had to be pretty tough, and he was gone a long time. So Tina and the kids lived with Larry's grandmother for a while in a nice house in Hamilton Township. That's just south of Columbus. It was a pretty suburban area surrounded by farmland and fruit orchards. But Larry was just away so much that he began to feel like a stranger in his own home. And Tina really wanted a husband who was there to help her raise the kids. She was very lonely. Larry wanted to provide for Tina and their two kids, but he knew if he was going to do that, he had to be out on the road or else he'd have to take some kind of minimum wage job. Yeah, and you have to work two or three of them to make the money he was making as a trucker. Yeah, so in many ways, it's a virtuous decision. The arguments, though, became more frequent and they fell out of love. Frustrated and sad that her marriage was ending, Tina moved out of the house and took the kids with her. So there was a lot of anger and yelling between Larry and Tina right after they separated. But they did respect each other as people and also as parents. So as rough as things got, they never put their children in the middle of their disputes. As time passed and the anger seemed to subside a little bit, Larry and Tina were able to, to agree that they cared about each other and they really shared the same common goal, just providing the best for their children. Tina had also been Larry's first love and she was the mother of his children. So even though love wasn't enough to keep them together, it was enough for him to respect her and try and get along and parent together. Larry's time away driving the truck was just way too much for them to manage as a couple, though. So they couldn't work things out. Yeah, but they, they seem to have maintained a decent relationship after the divorce. Yes, they seem to. So Tina, Sarah, and Cody moved into an apartment in Hilliard. And that's a suburb on the west side of Columbus. Now, even though they were no longer living with Larry, he stayed involved, and he was pretty proud of both his kids. They did well in school, they played sports, and they had a lot of friends. They were pretty kind kids. Cody especially did not like to see anyone bullied, and he made an effort to spend time with the kids who were cast aside and mistreated by other kids. Yeah, that's something that several people remarked about. In fact, Cody's kindness was really well known at his school because he was always willing to help out and he would even stand up for some of the unpopular kids. Good for him. Despite seeing his kids as much as he could, Larry is lonely being on his own. He liked being a family man and he wanted to be married again. 
And in 2005, he met a pretty brunette named Tracy, and they started dating. Tracy was calm and caring, and just what Larry wanted in a partner. They hadn't dated for very long at all before they decided to get married. And Tracy gave birth to their son, AJ, in 2006. So that's pretty fast. He met her in 2005. Yep. They had a son the following year. So they, they met, fell in love, had sex, got married. It seems like Larry really kind of rushed into things a little bit. Well, yeah, look, he, he married his first wife when they were teens, right? Yeah. 1920. Yeah, young. Right Very young. And then he meets this woman in 2005, and within a year or so, they're married and have a child. Yeah, he didn't waste any time. Nope. So little AJ was a really energetic and loving little boy, and he really looked up to and adored his big brother, Cody. And then soon, Tina met a man of her own. This was Greg Borders, who worked at the Target Distribution Center with her. He was tall and handsome, and at first he seemed just perfect to Tina. So they dated and eventually moved in together, and they were just down the street from Larry and his second wife, so that was convenient. That's <laughs> kind of weird to me. <laughs> I, mean, I guess it's convenient, but... It is for sharing custody. Yes. So 2006, right after AJ was born, Larry had been lucky enough to find a job driving locally, and he really loved that. He had more time with his kids. Sarah and Cody would spend two to four days at a time with him and Tracy and AJ. Now Larry was able to play ball in the yard with Cody and Sarah, and Sarah and Cody seemed to get along really well most of the time. Sarah even became a cheerleader for Cody's Junior League football team as a way to show him her support. So that's super sweet. Yeah, we're doing okay here, right? Yeah, so everything seemed to be going well for a time. But then the economy tanked. Yeah, in 2008, Tracy lost her job. Then Larry got laid off. Desperately needing the money, he took a truck driving job in Kentucky. Now, Larry knew this would take him away from Sarah and Cody for those long periods of time. But now he had Tracy and AJ to take care of, as well as Sarah and Cody. So Larry, Tracy, and little AJ moved to Kentucky, where he began hauling fuel for a mining company. And his visits with Sarah and Cody were limited to birthdays and some holidays. Well, yes, it's a vast difference from living down the street. That's right. So things really changed. So and this was difficult for everyone to get adjusted to. But times were tough. They were so tough that Larry and Tracy were just happy to have a regular paycheck coming in. Yes, yeah, so Larry worked the Kentucky job for about a year and a half, and then he took a better paying job in Florida. So Tina actually considered moving with the kids down to Florida too. But then in the end, she decided to play it safe as she just started a new job in Ohio. So her boyfriend Greg, Sarah, and Cody moved with Tina to Apple Valley. So this is a really nice area on a beautiful lake. It's about 50 miles from Columbus. And some of the more expensive homes were lakefront properties with their own boat docks and piers. Although their house was small and far from fancy, the surrounding area had lots of natural space for the kids to go out and play, and the town had excellent schools. So Apple Valley was considered a really great place for kids to grow up, and that was the most important thing to Tina. Their new home was on King Beach Drive and had a really large backyard. It was kind of isolated from the other homes too, with farmland across the road and a large wooded area. So the neighborhood seemed like a very safe environment for her kids. Crime was infrequent there, and it seemed like nothing really bad had ever happened in Apple Valley. But that would change. Oh yes. So after they moved in, Tina became really good friends with Stephanie Sprang. She was a 41-year-old woman who lived two houses away. Stephanie was a lot like Tina, fun and hardworking. And the two women got together to shop, and they took turns watching each other's kids. Sarah and Cody would play with Stephanie's three children, and all of the kids got along well. So Tina and Greg pitched in together to buy the house. Tina began working at the local Dairy Queen, while Greg had to drive almost 60 miles each way to work at the Target Distribution Center. So this meant that he would be getting up at 3 a.m. to get to work on time. Yeah, so that seems like a bit of a sacrifice to do that. I think so. Yeah. They found this beautiful place. It sounds like an ideal place to raise kids, but there is a payback for that. you got to drive over an hour each way. 
Yeah. So then in 2010, Larry's grandmother moved into a nursing home and she left him her house in Hamilton. Larry had always loved that place, so he and Tracy decided to leave Florida and move back there. This was a very nice suburban house with a big yard, and of course it was much closer to Sarah and Cody. Now Larry took a job delivering fuel to gas stations in the Columbus area, and now Larry could see Sarah and Cody on a more regular basis. Sarah joined a softball team, and her team played in a regional competition, and Cody started playing baseball too. He was a very good pitcher. Tina spent time with her friend Stephanie Spring quite a bit, and the two laughed a lot and did just about everything together in their Apple Valley neighborhood. They were two women who had a lot in common, even though there was a pretty big age difference. But it was just really nice for Tina to have a friend like that, because things with Greg weren't always great. So Stephanie had been working at a golf course for many years, but by 2009 she did odd jobs around Mount Vernon and Apple Valley to make some extra money. And one of those jobs was as a house cleaner. And one of her jobs was at a house on Columbus Road in Mount Vernon. And that's where a strange young man was living, Matthew Hoffman. Now, Matthew had not always been so strange as he was in 2010. Like some other boys his age, he played baseball and enjoyed going out on adventures. But he did seem kind of obsessed with trees. He loved going out in the woods and climbing them. It kind of seemed to be his safe place where he could escape his problems and find some time alone. His childhood was unremarkable as far as I could see. There were no signs of abuse. He's the son of Robert and Patricia Hoffman, and he grew up in northeastern Ohio. According to his mom, Patricia, he was a good boy, if a bit high-strung. He was intelligent and had a lot of energy, so maybe some ADHD. That's a possibility, yeah. Yeah. But he was also really stubborn because when he wanted something to go a certain way, it was close to impossible to get him to change his mind. Socially, the young Matthew could be awkward and seemed to enjoy confusing people. Like if someone said good morning to him, as an example, he might respond with, yeah, what's so good about it? But people who knew him as a child would later recall asking him normal questions and getting these off-the-wall answers. He didn't seem sinister or frightening, though but he did march to a different beat than everyone else. That seemed clear. Then in 1997, Hoffman's parents divorced, and Hoffman moved with his mother to the Mount Vernon area. One neighbor would recall Hoffman as a teenager, 14 to 16 years old, and she thought that he always seemed unhappy, lost, and just not on a good path in his life. Nothing major, but enough stuff to be a concern. He did get into trouble when he and some friends climbed onto the roof of Lakeview High School. And when he was caught by the police, his explanation was he just wanted to see if he could do it. Hoffman also liked to jump off the roof of his house onto a trampoline in the yard. Now, he definitely seemed to enjoy heights and the thrill of taking risks. Right, so all that doesn't really seem that strange to me. No, it's not. I mean, growing up, there were lots of boys, even some girls that were like that. But he did kind of have a different way of speaking with people that could be a little uncomfortable, I guess. Despite his above average intelligence, Hoffman didn't enjoy high school at all. He did graduate in 1999, going on to study industrial electrical engineering at the Knox County Career Center. But after completing the program, he ended up going from job to job because he had a really hard time getting along with people. So that was a real problem. In 2000, when he was 19 years old, Hoffman left Ohio and moved nearer to his grandmother, who lived in Steamboat Springs, Colorado. And when he was there, he got into some serious trouble. Steamboat Springs is at an elevation of around 5,000 feet, and it was a growing and very popular resort for outdoor activities, especially skiing. And like Aspen and Vail, it is known for tourism, both winter and summer sports. Sure. Now, some of the most ostentatious homes in the area were worth millions of dollars, and these luxurious homes were located up on the mountains so that they had these expansive views. And people who lived there 
would often fly their private jets into the local airport. But of course, Hoffman wasn't living in one of those houses. He worked as a plumber's helper, and he lived in the D. Barquet Motel. So that's a far cry from those homes. Yeah, you probably can't even hear them if you're yelling. That's a joke. <laughs> yeah, not a very good one, okay. <laughs> I know. So the D. Barquet Motel was a place where many low-income workers lived. Wasn't great, but it was all he could afford. Yeah, which, you know, he was young, no big deal. But fellow D. Barquet Motel residents noticed that Hoffman was away from his hotel room for several nights in September of 2000. And during this time, there was a large condominium fire nearby. And then after that, Hoffman left town all of a sudden. Around the same time of the fire, the Steamboat Springs Police Department learned that three city signs had been stolen from the local park and they found them in Hoffman's motel room after he left. So these were those huge metal and wooden signs that said, Welcome to Steamboat Springs. So it had to take a lot of work to detach them from the poles and then transport them in a truck. And he didn't own a truck. And he would have had to do this with no one watching, of course. So the local police learned that Matthew Hoffman had been the only renter of Unit 6 of that motel. And when the police entered the unit, they found one of the signs, and then they found the other two stashed beneath the motel. So this is very odd. It's not like stealing a stop sign or something. No. These, these are those big... Huge. Welcome to signs. Yes. Huh. So officers were able to review Hoffman's rental application, and that's where they found his grandmother's contact information. And when they spoke with Hoffman's grandmother, she told them that Hoffman had been in the Steamboat Springs area, but that he had recently left. And soon after, Hoffman's mother Patricia called the police from Ohio to ask why they were looking for her son, because she was concerned. After she heard what was going on, Patricia said she would have Hoffman contact them as soon as possible. Yeah, so six days later, the police got a phone call from Matthew Hoffman. He asked for a return call and gave a phone number where he could be reached. So police called Hoffman on September 14, 2000, and asked him if he had stolen three signs from the city park. And he surprised them. He admitted right off that he was responsible for stealing the signs. And he even gave the details of how he had loaded the signs onto a pickup truck that had a rack, and then drove them to the D. Barquet Motel. He actually seemed proud of his accomplishments. Yeah, that was strange. And when asked why he stole the signs, he said that he wanted some souvenirs from Steamboat Springs. Well, that's a souvenir, all right. Yeah, apparently a refrigerator magnet or a t-shirt just wasn't going to cut it. But the other thing is he hadn't taken the signs with him when he left town, so he didn't really want them. I think it might have just been the challenge of doing it. Yeah, that's a likely thing. So he was given the choice to return to Steamboat on his own, or to be arrested and extradited back to Steamboat Springs. And Hoffman said he'd return on his own. So he was given until September 26th to show up or a warrant for his arrest would be issued. When the officer who spoke to Hoffman mentioned Hoffman's confession to a Steamboat Springs detective, the detective was really suspicious because he knew that Hoffman had been working for Scott Barnes Plumbing. And this was a business that sent plumbers to the condo complex where there had been that recent arson fire. So the detective also knew that just two weeks before that fire, a plumber had done work in condo number seven, and that just happened to be the unit that the arson investigator had decided was the fire's point of origin. Oh. So this is all just a little too coincidental. It certainly is. Could Mr. Hoffman have something to do with this? So when Hoffman showed up at the police station in Steamboat Springs on September 26th, he was read his Miranda rights. Hoffman signed a waiver of his rights, and he was asked questions about the theft of the Welcome to Steamboat Springs signs. So Hoffman told him that he'd asked a friend at the D. Barquet Motel, who went by the name Freedom, if he could borrow his red Nissan pickup truck, and according to Hoffman, Freedom had agreed. So around midnight, one night, Hoffman decided this was the time to steal those signs. Hoffman said he was happy that they'd recovered all the parts of the signs that had broken off when he was removing them from their mounts. When asked again 
why he'd stolen the signs. Hoffman said he just wanted them as a novelty. <laughs> now, come well, on. That's it, not believable. He doesn't even have a house. No. And when Freedom, the, the owner of the pickup, was contacted, he denied ever giving Hoffman permission to borrow it. Yeah, so apparently he'd stolen it. But Hoffman admitted to detectives that he'd worked for the Scott Barnes Plumbing Company. And when asked if he'd installed a garbage disposal in Unit 7 of the Ridge Condominium Complex, Hoffman said that he and Scott Barnes had installed a garbage disposal there, and they had also unclogged a bathtub in another unit. Which, mentioning that other unit is just a way to kind of distract. Yeah, well, I guess he's trying to... Uh distract them or draw the attention away from him. Well, sure, you see. Well, sure, I was in there, but I was in this other condo, too, thinking he's making himself less of a suspect. Yeah, but actually he's making himself more of a suspect. Oh, sure. When asked about the fire, Hoffman knew about it, and he was asked why his fingerprints had been found on several boxes at the condo, and also on the condo owner's car. So this was a car that had been stolen from the garage of the burned-out condo at around the same time. Hoffman said that he may have picked up the boxes and moved some furniture that was in the way of his plumbing job. But the detective kind of laughed at him and asked, you know, why would you have to move furniture in order to install a garbage disposal? And Hoffman <laughs> really didn't have an answer for that. Yeah, that's a tough one. So after that, he kind of sat and said nothing. And the detective then asked him why his fingerprints were on the driver's side door of the condo owner's Suburban, which had been found filled with property that had been taken from that condo. Hoffman initially tried to say that he had just touched the car because he was just looking at it, but soon he admitted to putting the items in it and driving it. And then as questioning continued, Hoffman raised his arms and said, Okay, you obviously got me. Well, he caved quickly. Yeah, but they did have him. Oh, well, they certainly did. One of those not well thought out crimes. Oh, yeah. So now two detectives came into the room with the tape recorder and the case files from that condo fire. And they began asking Matthew Hoffman about the items that had been stolen from the condo and put into the suburban. And the things he had taken were just weird and random. Like he'd taken a stuffed mountain lion and then a dresser from a bedroom, and then just a random bag of clothing. And then when he was asked about a missing bear rug, and an antelope head, and a wooden bench, he said he hadn't stolen those things and they must have burned up in the fire. Asked about some office equipment, Hoffman said he had stolen a fax machine and put it on the passenger seat of the Suburban. Hoffman told them that he had taken things on two occasions, one of them was on the night of the fire. And he admitted to being in that condo five separate times. He said he'd stayed there and watched some TV because his place didn't have cable. And he'd also cooked some meals there and used the jacuzzi. So he's kind of moved into this place while the owner's away. And the owner had never given him permission to do that. No, the owner didn't really know him. Yeah. <laughs> yeah so it's pretty creepy. Sure is. But he had been confident spending time in the condo because he knew that the owner was out of town. The detectives then asked him why he had set the fire, and he confessed to that, too. He told them he'd burned the condo to cover up his crimes, because he knew his fingerprints were all over the place. So he said he couldn't clean up all of his fingerprints. So, in his mind, he really had no choice but to start the fire. Yeah, otherwise I'm going to get caught, so I need to take care of this. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't Jeez. make a lot of sense, though. No. So he was asked what kind of accelerant he'd used to start the fire, and Hoffman told them he used premium gasoline, which they already knew. They also wanted to know what containers he'd carried the gasoline in, and Hoffman said he had used milk jugs. And then he left, saying, no, I'm just kidding. He'd actually bought two plastic gas cans at the local Walmart. And after he filled the containers with gasoline, he drove back to the condo. And he then decided to drive the owner's Suburban to the Clock Tower building, where he planned to pick it up the next day with all of the stolen things inside it. So he had parked the Suburban, walked back to the condo, and he sat there watching TV all day. He knew he was going to start the fire, he said, but he regretted it in hindsight. Yeah, that's not good enough. Well, the next morning, while he was still staying at that condo, 
Hoffman had poured ten gallons of gasoline on the floors of all the rooms, and then he lit the fire and walked out. The police asked him if he knew that there were tenants inside of that building when he set the fire, and of course he did. He knew there were people in the other units, but he claimed that he knew the fire alarm would warn them and everyone would be okay. But he really didn't show any concern about these other residents at all. It seemed like he didn't necessarily want to kill anyone, but if someone died in the fire, he really wouldn't have cared. So that's pretty strange, but it definitely makes him a dangerous person. Huh. Yes, it does. Definitely more than just a simple thief. So when that police interview ended... Hoffman wrote out a confession. He was arrested and taken to jail, where he was held for the theft of the signs, burglary, and of course arson. His bond was set at $25,000. So he was charged with arson, unlawfully and knowingly breaking and entering into the condo, first degree aggravated motor vehicle theft, and the theft of property from the condo, and then most importantly, reckless endangerment of the lives of the people living in that building. In the preliminary hearing, the judge agreed that there was enough evidence for the case to go to trial. Hoffman was given a court-appointed attorney who advised him against going to trial. He said, you will just get fried if you go to trial. So he pled guilty to the charges in hopes of getting some leniency. So before he was sentenced, Hoffman made a statement to the judge. He claimed that he now understood the impact and devastation he had caused to others, especially the condo owner's family. Hoffman said he'd really lost sight of what was most important in life. He had thought that money was, but now he claimed that the A number one thing that money can't buy is God. And along with God, you get love and the beauty of nature. He said these few things are omnipresent in every aspect of our daily routine. So Hoffman swore that he would learn from this experience and become a better man and a useful member of society. He promised he was going to turn his life around. So Hoffman was sentenced to eight years in prison, which is significant, minus the 102 days he had already served in jail. But this was a fairly light sentence for the crimes he'd committed. Yeah, I mean, he could have killed people. Oh, yeah. So. Absolutely. I think he was fortunate. So Hoffman mostly kept to himself in prison. He was a model prisoner, and he completed a victim impact awareness program and received a certificate for Microsoft Works Education. He served six years of his eight-year sentence. Once he was released from prison, Hoffman moved back to Ohio, where his mother lived, and that was the condition of his release, his parole. He found a job in Ohio as a tree trimmer, and that seemed perfect for him because he'd always liked being around trees. And his employer thought that Hoffman was a really nice guy. There was nothing strange about him, at least in the beginning, and he just blended in pretty nicely with the other employees. But with time, people began to see strange behavior. He would often just stare off into space, and he often said strange, off-the-wall things. But at least for a while, things seemed to be getting better for Hoffman. He had the tree trimming job. He had met a smart and attractive girlfriend. And he was even able to buy a house in 2009. The house was over 100 years old. It cost him only $37,000 because it needed a lot of repairs and upgrades. Now, is he planning on doing this himself? I think that was the plan. Although I don't think much ever really got done. Just a little fixer-upper. Yeah. I mean, a hundred-year-old home, there's probably a ton of shit that needs work. Yeah, and even if you can do a lot of it yourself, the supplies would be very expensive. Yeah. But, but nevertheless, Hoffman and his girlfriend and her eight-year-old son moved in, and they seemed pretty happy. They did. Next-door neighbor Donna Davis, a mother of three children, really liked the 30-year-old Matthew Hoffman. He lived next door to her in a two-story house. Donna's oldest son went to Hoffman's house often to play with his girlfriend's son, and the two boys would play catch, watch TV, and just hang out together after school. Hoffman was friendly in the beginning, and he let the boys jump around on a trampoline and even made popcorn for them to watch TV. The boys also had sleepovers at Hoffman's house. Now, once in a while, Hoffman would give Donna's 14-year-old daughter rides home from the movies, and she trusted him. 
He was quiet, but not unusually so, and he really just seemed like a nice guy. But then, towards the end of the summer in 2010, Matthew Hoffman began to change. He became irritable and moody. Then one day, his dogs just disappeared, and Donna believed that he killed those dogs. He really started pulling away from people. No one knew what had set him off in this bad direction, but he was just becoming stranger and much less friendly. Around this same time, Hoffman began setting squirrel traps around his yard. He used to love the squirrels and hang out with them and even feed them. The kids used to watch him hand feed the squirrels. But then Donna learned from his girlfriend that Hoffman was catching the squirrels, taking them into his house, butchering them and eating them. The girlfriend said that he would even barbecue the squirrels or freeze them and keep them in the freezer. Okay. So that's very odd. So but there was no apparent precipitating event that caused this personality change. Not that anyone could see or anyone's revealed to us, no. Because this is, this sounds pretty major. Yeah. Catching squirrels, eating them. Yes. Killing dogs, most likely. Yeah. Uh, and he, it seemed like he used to love animals, so right. not sure where that came from. He was at the age where some mental illnesses really come out, right? Yeah, I think he's probably a little older than that, but yeah. Yeah, 20s. So his, his behavior got so bizarre that Donna stopped allowing her daughter to ride home from the movie theater with him because he also began taking the girl on back roads on the way home. And when we say back roads, these roads he took her on were just rural areas surrounded by woods. And nothing around there. Right, not even really close to the normal route home. Nope. So Donna's daughter told her that this made her uncomfortable, and that's understandable. Then Donna stopped letting her son play next door. Hoffman was just too weird. His girlfriend had also begun acting differently. She'd been talkative and outgoing before, but by the fall of 2010, she was quiet and distant. She seemed to be afraid of him. By that time, whenever she went over to see Donna, it seemed as if she had to sneak out of the house. It got so bad that Donna feared for the girlfriend's safety, and she was on track thinking that. Oh, she was spot on. Yeah. Now, there was an incident in that October that exposed Matthew Hoffman as a dangerous guy. Hoffman's girlfriend had had enough of his strange behavior, and she and her son moved out. One day she came back to pick up some things that she left behind, and she and Hoffman got into an argument. And as the argument escalated, she tried to leave, but Hoffman pushed her over a chair and onto the floor, and then he started choking her. She said in a police report that they were in the living room talking when he got upset and pushed her against the wall. He had his forearm up against her neck, choking her. She said they fought and he choked her again as they rolled around on the floor. Finally, he let her up and she left the house. So she did report the incident to the police. But then, for some reason, she didn't press charges. Yeah, maybe she was afraid to. Well, we, we hear this story frequently of abused spouses. They're so afraid of the spouse that they don't leave. Right. Or they don't proceed with charges. Exactly. And maybe she just considered herself lucky to get away from him. Yeah, if she's truly away from him. Right. Now, after that, the next door neighbor didn't let her children go anywhere near Hoffman or even his house. She wouldn't even let them play in their own yard if he was outside because his behavior was becoming more and more concerning. Sometimes he'd climb up into the branches of a large tree on his property and sit up there for literally hours just watching the neighbors. How weird would that be? I can't imagine. He would also spend hours lying in a hammock in that tree. So he really did seem kind of obsessed with trees. And he seemed to just be getting worse because then he had his electricity shut off. And with winter right around the corner, it seemed really crazy to be living without any electricity. Oh, I would think so. Yeah. And it's Ohio, so it's not a warm climate. No, even October could get pretty chilly. Yeah. So then Hoffman lost his job because his boss learned that he had exaggerated his tree trimming experience. And the other thing, maybe more importantly, hadn't told him that he'd been in prison. So here he is. He's jobless now, no electricity, and his girlfriend had left him. He was an angry guy, and many of his worst impulses returned. 
One thing he did like to do was break into other people's homes, because this made him, at least to himself, different and special. Now, he knew about a place in the town of Howard, named Apple Valley, that he'd been thinking about breaking into. There was a house that sat alone on a quiet street across from some woods, and his garage door wouldn't close all the way. That would give him easy access into the house. And he had spent some considerable amount of time watching this place. A lot of time. So his plan was that he would wait until all of the people left the house in the morning, and then he would go in and take whatever he wanted. That's what he said, anyway. But what if his motive was not to steal from the house? What if what he really wanted was a person? Like a 13-year-old girl? Bingo. That sounds like more of a motive to me. There had been reports of someone watching Tina Herrmann's house from the woods across the street as early as 30 days before Matthew Hoffman entered the home. Now his mother lived within walking distance of the home, so that kind of gave him a reason to be in the neighborhood, but he was definitely planning to enter that house illegally, even when his motive for doing so was unknown. On November 9, 2010, Hoffman parked his car nearby at the Gap Trail parking lot which is just a few miles away from the house, and this is a short time before midnight. And from there, he walked into the woods across the street from Tina Herman's house and arrived somewhere around 1 a.m. on November 10th. With him, he had food, a water bottle, and a sleeping bag. So he got into his sleeping bag, fell asleep for a couple hours. Then he woke up in time to hear a car pulling out of the driveway of the house very early in the morning like just after 3 a.m. And that was Greg, Greg Borders, the live-in boyfriend, and he's leaving for work. So Hoffman settled back down in the sleeping bag and fell asleep again. He was waiting until everybody had left the house before he made a move. And we do know that Hoffman got some kind of thrill from entering other people's houses. But he also probably knew that a pretty 13-year-old girl lived in that house. Hoffman would later claim that he didn't know that. But as we go over the events surrounding his crimes, it seems more than possible, probably even likely, that 13-year-old Sarah Maynard was his real motivation from the beginning. Oh, I definitely think so. Now for Tina Herrmann, that day was going to be quite a busy one. She and her best friend and neighbor, Stephanie, had plans to go apartment hunting. Tina and Greg had not been getting along for some time, and that relationship was ending, and the house was in his name so Tina was planning to move out with Sarah and Cody. So the day had begun very early for the household as usual when Craig left by 3.40 a.m. for his job at the Target Distribution Center. Later that morning, he spoke to Tina on his cell phone from work. Sarah and Cody ate breakfast, grabbed their school supplies, and walked to their bus, which would take them to East Knox Middle School. Once the kids were on their way, Tina went out to buy some groceries. She also stopped to put some gas in her car, and she may have visited a tanning salon as well before she returned home just after noontime. So she pulled into her driveway as usual, parked her pickup truck, and carried her groceries into the kitchen. But sometime while Tina was out, Matthew Hoffman had entered her home through that partially open, damaged garage door. He'd actually been inside of her house for at least an hour when she got home. As soon as Tina walked in the door carrying her bags of groceries, Hoffman came barreling down the hallway and grabbed her and dragged her into the master bedroom. So only Hoffman knows exactly what happened after that, but by looking at the evidence, it seems that he pushed Tina down on her bed and hit her in the back of her head with a blackjack that he'd brought along. So I didn't know what a blackjack was. I looked it up. It's this flexible billy club type thing with a weighted head on it but he also had a sharp hunting knife with him. So he may have already stabbed Tina before he heard another person entering the house. He was surprised by Stephanie Sprang, Tina's friend, who'd walked into the unlocked house. Blood evidence would later prove that Hoffman killed Stephanie in Sarah's bedroom. After seeing Hoffman with Tina in the master bedroom, Stephanie either ran to Sarah's bedroom or Hoffman dragged her there. So neither Stephanie nor Tina could fight him off. He overpowered each of them. And these stab wounds were brutal. Stephanie would have died in seconds. But Hoffman didn't stop once she was dead. There seemed to be some kind of rage. 
He stabbed Stephanie repeatedly. Her blood spattered all over the walls and soaked into the floor of Sarah's bedroom. This is just a real nightmare. Then Hoffman returned to Tina after that and kept stabbing her. He stabbed her over and over, puncturing her vital organs. And this was so violent, Dick, that he ripped open her abdomen with the knife. So kind of was, like gutting an animal. Yeah, it's just like a frenzy. Yeah, vicious overkill. And after making sure both women were dead, he dragged Tina's body into the bathroom, put Tina's body in the bathtub, and dismembered her body with his hunting knife. Hoffman was strong, and he knew how to hunt and gut animals. And he knew that his knife wouldn't be able to cut through bones, so he disarticulated Tina's body at the joints. Now, when he did this, he seemed to really be very matter-of-fact about it. It seems like he had planned to do that to Tina, at least. Yeah, I think we're at the point where we have to question the idea that he had gone into the house to commit a burglary and things went wrong. Yeah, he could have stolen things while she was out buying groceries and getting gas and been out. Right. He didn't need to stay there. No. So he stayed there till she got home, then Stephanie got there, and he still didn't leave. Nope. Though he murdered Tina, he murdered Stephanie, and then the family dog wouldn't stop barking, so he murdered the dog too bastard. But he didn't take anything, nor did he leave the house. He stayed and processed the bodies, as he put it, for at least a couple more hours. So this is a real sicko. He's a piece of work. So, as you can imagine, and you probably don't want to imagine, taking apart the bodies was a really bloody and horrific process. The bathtub in most of the bathroom was coated with blood and human tissue. Hoffman found some plastic trash bags in the house, and he put Tina's body parts into them. They weren't large, so he had to use several bags, and then he dismembered the dog's body and put the parts into garbage bags. Then he did the same to Stephanie's body. And once he was finished with this, Hoffman found some motor oil and poured it over the large blood stains and the bloody drag marks on the floor. So he planned to set the house on fire, just like he'd done to the condo back in Colorado, and he believed that the oil would burn and camouflage all of the blood, even if the whole house didn't burn down completely. Yeah, well, he was wrong about that. Yeah, well, he never got a chance to set the fire. So 11-year-old Cody and 13-year-old Sarah rode their school bus back home like any other day, having no idea of the horror that was waiting there for them. From the bus stop, they walked to the front door of their house, and nothing outside of the house would have tipped them off at all. Their mom's car was there, and everything looked normal. But inside, it was a totally different story. As soon as they entered through the kitchen door, the kids saw something shocking and confusing. Blood. They always took off their shoes just inside the front door, and as Sarah stopped to do that, she and Cody saw what looked like blood near the door. And a lot of it. Tina didn't seem to be there either because she would normally greet them at the door if she was home. So both kids were calling out mom, but instead of getting an answer, they were confronted by this large man running at them from the hallway. And he had attacked them before they even had any idea what was happening. When he came at them, Sarah was able to slip past him and run into her bedroom as Cody was trying to run out the front door. Sarah slammed her bedroom door shut and tried to find her cell phone, but it all happened so fast. She looked around and saw blood all over the walls and her bed. Before she could even call for help, the man came storming into her room and tackled her, and he held her, and she could see that he had this large knife, so Sarah was sure that he would stab her to death. But instead, he cut some of the electrical wiring of a fan in the room and tied her hands together with that. Then he told her he would kill her if she screamed or cried. Sarah would remember his voice being very angry. He was yelling at her. He told her what to do, and she cooperated, hoping that he might let her go. But Hoffman used a cloth to gag her, and then he draped her over her shoulder. And that's when she realized how strong he was, and she had no chance to escape from him. He carried her down into the basement, where he found an old sled. He cut off the rope that was attached to the sled, and he tied her legs together. And then he put a pillowcase over her head and carried her back upstairs, and he left her on the kitchen floor. So Sarah couldn't see what he was doing, but she could hear him searching for something under the sink. And eventually he seemed to find what he wanted and left the room. 
Sarah remembered seeing her mom's bags of groceries on the floor, and this told her that something really bad had happened to her mom. As Sarah lay on the kitchen floor wondering if Hoffman had killed her mother and brother, she could hear water running in a bathtub down the hall. Every few minutes she heard the toilet flush too, and this seemed to go on for hours. Sarah could see that it was getting dark outside, and Hoffman turned on some lights in the house, and then he was still doing something in the bathroom. He was in there for a long time, banging and flushing and running water. Sarah remembered that he was breathing heavily when he came out of the bathroom too. So she didn't know what he was doing, but of course she was terrified, that goes without saying. But lying there, Sarah also had to wonder why her dog wasn't barking. Had this man killed her dog, or had he let her dog out of the house? Sarah had to be afraid for her family and her life, but amazingly, she was able to think through things clearly, and she really concentrated on her own survival. So for a 13-year-old, or anyone for that matter, this could have been really overwhelming but she somehow managed to keep calm. After what seemed like several hours, Hoffman returned to the kitchen and he told Sarah not to fight or try to escape or he would kill her. So he blindfolded her, picked her up and carried her down the outside steps. She then realized that she was inside Stephanie's Jeep and the Jeep was in the garage. She could feel something in the back seat next to her, but she didn't know what it was. When he returned to the Jeep, Hoffman put blankets over her and Hoffman got into the driver's seat, backed out of the garage. At this point, it's completely dark outside, and when they arrived at their destination, Hoffman parked the Jeep and told her to stay where she was, adding that he'd be watching her. Sarah could hear him walking away. She twisted her body until the blindfold came a little loose and she could see a bit. Peeking around, she realized that she was sitting in Stephanie's Jeep at a baseball field, one where Cody had played before. Sarah could also see that there were a lot of trash bags next to her inside the Jeep. Thankfully, she still had no idea what was in those bags. But we know that these bags were filled with the dismembered body parts of her mother, her brother, her mother's best friend, and her dog. Unbelievable. Absolutely. So Sarah didn't know it, but Cody had been killed just steps from the doorway as she ran into her room. Hoffman actually stabbed the boy in his head with the hunting knife. So Cody was likely dead before he even hit the floor. But Hoffman didn't stab his victims just once. Again, he stabbed the boy, at least two more times to make sure he was dead, and then he rushed after Sarah. He found Sarah trying to call 911 in her bedroom, but Hoffman took the phone away from her and raised his knife as if to stab her, but then he pulled back. So Hoffman would never really explain why he didn't kill Sarah, this is one thing that makes me believe that Hoffman had gone into the house with the intention of abducting Sarah. If he'd been watching the house for up to 30 days or so, he knew who lived there and he knew their routines. Maybe he expected Tina to be out at work all day. Then he wouldn't have expected her friend and neighbor Stephanie to show up either. Maybe he planned on staying in the house until the kids arrived home, knocking out or killing Cody and taking Sarah. In the Jeep, Hoffman told Sarah that he had someone watching her. If she did anything, that person was going to kill her. So Hoffman then got out of the Jeep and left the parking lot, walking to the other parking lot where he'd left his Toyota Yaris. Hoffman got into his Yaris and drove back to where the Jeep was. And since he'd parked it far back in the lot, no one had come by. Sarah was still bound in the back with the trash bags. Yeah, so Sarah had considered trying to escape, but she believed him when he said there was someone else watching her. And you can't blame her. No. So absolutely. she was just terrified, as anyone would be. Yep. So Hoffman moved Sarah from the Jeep into the Yaris, and then he drove back to his house on Columbus Road. He parked the car in an alley out back, and then he carried Sarah into the house. Inside, he again told her not to make any trouble for him. He took her into a room, and then he removed her blindfold. And then Sarah saw that she was in a bathroom, and this was a really creepy bathroom. There were weird drawings in black ink on the white walls, mostly of faces and people and animals and combinations of animals and people. 
there was also this really creepy drawing of a bald man's face positioned so that the bathtub faucet looked like it was coming out of his mouth. Really creepy. Really? It, it just looked crazy to her, like something you'd see in a horror film. Yeah. Now Hoffman had to go back to the Jeep and get rid of all those trash bags. So he made sure that Sarah would not be able to escape by binding her with duct tape and rope. And Hoffman drove his Yaris, taking his tree trimming and climbing gear with him. He knew where he could hide the trash bags, where they would never be found. Yeah, so he drove to a Walmart and bought some blue tarp and large plastic garbage bags. He also bought himself a turkey sandwich and a $1 Halloween t-shirt. And this was at around midnight. He paid with cash, and then he drove away, parking his Yaris at a boat access parking area and walking back to the baseball field. Hoffman then drove the Jeep to a nature preserve. If he was lucky, no one would ever know what had happened at Sarah's house. He had been lucky that Tina's live-in boyfriend, Greg Borders, was gone all day and night, because after work on November 10th, Greg had spent the night at a friend's house, and the next day on November 11th, they'd gone golfing. So he had no idea that Tina was missing or that anything had happened at the house. Yeah, he was gone close to a couple days. Yeah. And remember, they were breaking up, so he was probably giving yeah. her some space. Right. So after getting rid of the trash bags, Hoffman drove the Jeep back to Sarah's house, and he took the pickup truck that was parked there. He left the extra trash bags and blue tarp that he'd just bought at Walmart in the garage. This might have been because he planned to come back and burn the house down. Get rid of the evidence. I think so. But the pickup truck didn't run well, and it kept bucking and stalling. So Hoffman had to leave the pickup in a parking lot near Kenyon College in the town of Gambier. From there, he started walking, and he reached his Yaris by the time the sun was coming up. Yeah, and so he's been at this for like 24 hours. Yeah, been a busy guy. So instead of going back to burn down the house right then, he decided to go home. He was exhausted. And he found Sarah there, still lying on the bathroom floor. Sarah was trying to stay awake all night, but she kept drifting off. She was exhausted, too. All that trauma. Oh, can only imagine. Now she had been thinking of ways to save herself, and she decided she would try and befriend her kidnapper. So by now, she was more suspicious about what Hoffman had done to her mom and Cody. She didn't even know that Stephanie Spring had been in her house. Sarah asked Hoffman about the weird drawings on the bathroom wall, and he told her about the characters that he'd drawn there. Some were half man and half animal, but much of what he said just sounded Looney Tunes. So he took Sarah out of the bathroom without her blindfold, and this is when she looked around and saw bags of leaves stacked up in every room, from the floor to the ceiling. There was also a thick blanket of leaves piled loosely on the floors. So he had to be hoarding all these leaves. But the funny thing is, is his neighbors said they never saw him out raking. <laughs> So maybe he did it in the middle of the night. He must have done it at some point because the house was filled. Filled. And when I say bags from ceiling to floor, I mean it. Like Walmart shopping bags filled with leaves and stapled to the wall. So Sarah asked questions and Hoffman told her that the leaves were used for insulation, which was weird. And when asked if he killed her family, he said no. He also told her that he just let the dog out of the house and the dog had run off. But by this time, she's hungry. It's been 24 hours almost, and she asked for something to eat. Hoffman offered her a squirrel, but Sarah said, no, I'd rather go hungry than eat a squirrel. <laughs> God. So he brought her a bowl of cereal, but the milk he poured on it was sour. She did force herself to eat most of it because she knew that she might not get a meal for a long time. So smart girl. Yeah, and Hoffman would say that he tied Sarah to him and slept on a couch. But Sarah contradicted this, saying that Hoffman had gagged her again and kept her tied up. He stuffed her in a closet at some point, but he did take a nap. Yes, but he would try and pretend after all of this that he'd been really nice to her. Played video games, fed her well, yeah. just a bunch of lies. When Tina Herrmann didn't show up for work at the Dairy Queen in Mount Vernon on the afternoon of November 10th, her friend and manager at the restaurant, Valerie, called the Knox County Sheriff's Office. Tina never missed work, especially without calling. She was a very responsible and hardworking person. So Valerie was worried that something bad had happened to her. Valerie talked to a dispatcher in the early evening and explained her concerns for her friend and coworker. And the dispatcher told Valerie that a sheriff's deputy 
would go to Tina's house to do a welfare check to see if anything seemed suspicious or out of place there. So Knox County Sheriff's Deputy Charles Statler was notified and headed out to do a welfare check on her house. His report read, Valerie advised that Tina did not show up for work today and she is concerned that something may have happened to her because Tina was going to break up with her boyfriend, Gregory Borders. So of course, they're worried about Greg being a suspect at this point. Sure. So Deputy Statler drove by the house just after 8 p.m. and he noticed that there was no vehicle in the driveway and no lights on in the house. He tried the doorbell and knocked on the front door, but no one answered. He didn't have a search warrant to enter the house and nothing was overtly suspicious. So he noted what he had seen and he left. But something about the situation did nag at him. So at 11.15 p.m. on his own, he did another welfare check. And this time the lights in the house were on and a blue 2004 Ford pickup was parked in the driveway. But still nothing seemed really suspicious and no one answered the door. So the deputy didn't know it, but Tina's live-in boyfriend, Greg Borders, was out of town overnight. Stephanie Springs' family weren't concerned about her yet. They may have thought she was spending the night with Tina, so no one had reported Stephanie missing. But when Tina didn't show up for work on Thursday, November 11th, her friend and manager Valerie was so concerned that she called the sheriff's office again. A deputy called Sarah and Cody's school and then learned that they had not shown up that day either. So now this was becoming really concerning. A short time later, Valerie called the sheriff's office again and told them that she'd found out that Tina's friend and neighbor, Stephanie Spring, was also missing. So that's very strange for a woman, her best friend, and her children to all be missing. So Valerie had called up Stephanie's house because she knew that Tina and Stephanie were so close. And that's when she found out they hadn't seen Stephanie. A welfare check was done at Stephanie's and another check outside of Tina's house. No one was at home at either house at this point. And the deputy also noticed that the blue Ford pickup that the other deputy had seen in the driveway the night before was now gone. So about 4 p.m. that day, Valerie managed to get a hold of Stephanie Springs' live-in boyfriend, Ron, and they agreed to meet and check Tina's house. Ron lived with Stephanie only a few houses down the road from Tina's house. So when Valerie arrived at Tina's, she and Ron talked about their concerns and then Valerie decided she was going inside. And it's been two days, so she's very worried. Oh yeah. She took down a screen from a window in the back of the house, opened the window and climbed inside. Everything was very still and quiet in there. So Valerie walked further into the house and saw something really shocking and terrifying. There was a lot of blood on the living room and hallway carpets and it looked like someone had been dragged across the carpet. So she's horrified, she can't believe her eyes, and she ran out of the house and called the sheriff's office again. The night before, the deputy had been sent only to do welfare checks, but now it was obvious that there was something very wrong at Tina's. So this time when the deputies arrived, they went inside and an investigation began. And because of the disturbing scene at Tina's house, the uh, police detective division took over the case and the detective division was led by Lieutenant Gary Roller. Prior to this case, almost all the deaths investigated by the detectives were the result of accidents. So this is certainly different from anything they'd seen before. Oh, absolutely, yes. So on Thursday, November 11, 2010, detectives hadn't been able to make any contact with Tina or Stephanie, and no one had heard from the children either. After Valerie had found all that blood in the house, the detectives went to Tina's house, and they entered the house looking for someone who might have been hurt. But they found so much blood on the carpet and what appeared to be bloody drag marks to the bathroom that it looked like a slaughterhouse. There was also blood in the basement, and Stephanie's Jeep was in the garage. So Tina's property was secured with crime scene tape. A detective called Stephanie's house, and by that time, someone was home. Stephanie's live-in boyfriend, Ron, told detectives that neither he nor Stephanie's children had seen or heard from her since noonish on Wednesday, November 10th, and that was when Ron had talked to her on the phone. Ron said that Stephanie had not been home when he got back later on November 10th, and he tried several times to reach her on her cell phone, but he had been repeatedly sent to her voicemail. Ron added that Tina and Stephanie had had plans to look at apartments that day because... 
Tina was going to move out. Yes, yeah, so after the crime scene had been found at Tina's house, the detectives requested a search warrant. But if they could locate Greg Borders, they could get permission from him to do the search. So as it happened, they didn't have to go looking for Greg because he showed up at the house at 5.30 p.m. And Greg explained to the detectives that his uncle had told him that there was police activity at his house. So he had rushed back home to see what was going on. Greg hadn't had his cell phone on, so he hadn't known anything was wrong until his uncle had finally gotten a hold of him. So Greg explained to the officers that he'd left the house on November 10th at little after 3 a.m. to go to work. And Greg said that he worked all that day and then stayed with a friend overnight. Greg added that he and his friend had gone golfing all day on November 11th. So the last time he'd seen Tina was on the night of the 9th. So Greg signed a consent to search for him for the house and gave verbal consent to have his body examined for any injuries. There were none. To cover their bases, the detectives went ahead with getting a search warrant. And the warrant read in part, At approximately 4.15 p.m. on November 11, 2010, Sergeant Tom Durbin and Sergeant Dexter responded to Valerie Haythorne's call and entered Miss Herman's residence, where they observed bloodstains on the living room and hallway carpet, apparent drag marks in the bloodstains on the hallway carpet, going in the direction of the bathroom, and a large amount of blood around the tub and toilet area. Well, you know, dismemberment is kind of messy. Oh, I just can't imagine how anyone could ever do that. I know. And the police also observed a gallon jug of what appeared to be motor oil in the hallway, with a 10-inch trail of liquid leading from the hallway to a bedroom. Yeah, that motor oil was found in lots of spots all over the house. They also saw blood stains going down the stairs to a lower-level garage where a 1996 Jeep with Ohio plates was parked. The Jeep was known to be driven by Stephanie Sprang. So deputies canvassed the neighborhood and questioned neighbors to see if anyone had seen anything. But as the detectives were searching Tina's house, Matthew Hoffman was planning to burn the place down in order to destroy all the evidence. So after 6 o'clock on Thursday, November 11th, Hoffman drove his car back to the parking lot near Kenyon College where he had left Tina's blue pickup. And he was planning to pick up the gas cans from the truck, fill them with gas, and drive back to Tina's house. But before he could get to the pickup at 6.55 p.m., a Knox County deputy was on his routine patrol and noticed the abandoned blue pickup. Now, this deputy knew that another deputy had seen a similar pickup in Tina Herman's driveway at around 11.15 p.m. on November 10th. The deputy also noticed something else that was odd. There was a silver car parked in a nearby parking lot, even though the lot was closed for the night. And there was a man sitting in the driver's seat. So the deputy approached Matthew Hoffman in his Toyota Yaris and asked him what he was doing there. He asked for his driver's license, too, and Hoffman cooperated. The deputy did note that the driver was Matthew Hoffman, and he asked Hoffman if the Apple Valley Drive address on his license was close to King Beach Drive, and Hoffman said his mother lived there. But now he lived on Columbus Road in Mount Vernon. So Hoffman said that he was at the parking lot because he was waiting for his girlfriend, Sarah. Now, the name Sarah didn't mean anything to the deputy at the time, so he told Hoffman to leave. Because Hoffman didn't want to drive his Yaris to Tina's house, he returned home to decide what to do. Now, not only was he worried about any evidence that had been left in Tina's house, he was concerned about things he had left in the woods across the street. He had to go get those things or they would lead the police back to him. So back at the parking lot near Kenyon College, investigators took photos of Tina's pickup and they searched that surrounding area. Once they were finished, they towed it to the police impound lot. Investigators would examine the inside of the truck for any blood or fingerprints that didn't belong to Tina, Stephanie, Sarah, or Cody. And while this is going on, Hoffman was moving Sarah into his basement and putting her on a pile of leaves. It was so dark that she couldn't see anything down there. No windows, so she couldn't even tell if it was day or night. Sarah would later say that he would just come down there and stand and stare at her, and then he would turn and go back upstairs. She couldn't understand what he wanted or what he was thinking, 
and even though there were blankets, she was very cold. So the plan she came up with was to deal with whatever was happening at the moment and not think too much about all the bad things that could happen to her. So that's very smart. Live for the moment. Worry about that later. Try to survive. Exactly. Because if you keep thinking about what could have happened and what might happen, you'd go crazy. So while Sarah was captive in that cold, dark basement, Hoffman repeatedly sexually assaulted her on that bed of leaves. When Hoffman returned to his house from the parking lot, he checked that Sarah was tied up on the bed of leaves in the basement, and then he drank a bottle of wine while he burned some evidence. He started a fire in his backyard and threw in his shoes and some clothing. Then he slept for a couple of hours and woke up around midnight. Before he left the house again, he went down to the basement and looked at Sarah again. In the early morning of November 12th, Hoffman drove back to the woods near Tina's house, where he'd spent the night of November 9th, watching the house. He wanted to see what kind of police activity was going on at the house and get his things from the woods. So Hoffman first drove to a parking lot, and then he rode his bike to a hill near Apple Valley Lake. There he left his bike and walked to the woods near Tina's house. It was miles away, so this took a long time. When he finally got to King Beach Drive, it was early morning. Hoffman saw the crime scene tape and the police cars, and he spent some time in the woods watching them. After watching for a while, he picked up his things, walked back to his bike, and then biked back to his car. The walk to his bicycle took a really long time, so it was about 9 a.m. when he got home. Now, Hoffman had told Sarah that someone else would be watching the house whenever he wasn't there. So she was tied to a bed frame on a bed of leaves and was helpless to escape anyway. Sarah did believe it when Hoffman told her he had an accomplice. So she decided to comply with whatever he wanted and not make any waves in order for her to survive. That's really smart, but it had to be so difficult. Must have been. So back at Tina's house, investigators had found several blood spatter stains on the west wall of the living room. The height of the stains was from 45 inches to 6 feet above the floor. And leading from a large saturated blood stain on a living room carpet was a swipe pattern consistent with a body being dragged. This pattern led from the stain down the hallway and to the entrance of the bathroom. In Tina's bedroom, they found another saturation stain of blood covered up with motor oil on the carpet. And the saturation stain was large enough to suggest that the bleeding person was left there for some time before being moved. And this carpeting was cut out and collected as evidence. In the bedroom, there is also a comforter with a blood saturation stain, again covered with motor oil. And this was found on the floor near the corner of the bed. A swipe pattern consistent with a blood-stained object being dragged and motor oil being poured over the swipe stain led from the bedroom, down the hallway, and into the bathroom. In Sarah's bedroom, they found another large saturation stain. And from that stain, a swipe pattern led through the bedroom, down the hallway, and again to the bathroom. So these stains were easily over one foot by one foot, with a large amount of the blood soaked into the carpet and there were three distinct drag marks that converged into that downstairs bathroom. But it was in the bathroom that the most blood stains were found. The bathtub and shower walls had more spatter stains. A large amount of the blood had been diluted with water, and mixed in with the blood were small pieces of body fat and tissue. On the edges of the tub and the toilet, which was also covered in blood, there were some fabric prints in blood and at the bottom of the basement stairs on a vinyl floor, there were circular drops of blood that had been diluted. Now near the Jeep in the garage, there were some blood drops which indicated some kind of movement by a person. Other blood drops were found on the garage floor, and on the inside of the garage door, there was a blood transfer pattern where it looked like a gloved hand had touched it. But in the blood in the garage, there were two sets of footprints found, and that led investigators to have some hope that maybe one of the victims was still alive. A shoe print, also thought to be from the perpetrator, was found in the hallway, and cloth gloves were found in the living room. The agents surmised that the perpetrator may have used those gloves. Now, in another of the shoe impressions, the agents were able to read the brand name, Airwalk, and this was from a size 7.5 shoe. In a further search of the house, they found that all of the shoes in Sarah's closet were size 7.5. So, 
they came to believe that the shoe impression had come from Sarah, so maybe Sarah was still alive. It did look like Sarah had not been killed at the house, but what happened to her after they had no idea. Still, there was this possibility that she was alive. And in addition to the many bloodstains covering the bathroom, especially around the toilet and tub, detectives found a Nokia cell phone and cell phone case on the bathroom floor. And there were also several bottles of cleaners with bleach in there. In the garage, investigators found a Walmart bag, which held several tarps and an open bag of 55-gallon heavy-duty trash bags. So the detectives believed that the perpetrator could have brought those items with him to the crime scene. And based on the large amount of blood in the bathroom, especially the tub, detectives thought that the killer could have dismembered one or more of the bodies in the bathtub and then put the body parts in the heavy-duty trash bags. That's what it's looking like. Surveillance footage from a local Walmart showed a white man, between 25 and 35 years old, buying the trash bags in blue tarp. He seemed to know his way around the store, and he seemed calm, like everything was totally normal. There were very few people in the store when he was there, at around midnight, and he paid for everything with cash. Yeah, so in order to identify Hoffman, agents spoke with the store's security department. They got a copy of the receipt for that transaction, and by comparing the product codes on the receipt with the items on the shelf, they were able to determine that the items from the crime scene matched the items that were purchased at Walmart. They could also see on the surveillance footage that the man crossed the parking lot and got into a small silver-colored car, and this car looked like a Toyota Yaris. The officers uploaded photos of a Toyota Yaris from the internet and they agreed that that silver car in the video matched. So officers researched all male owners of Toyota Yaris's in Knox County. Special Agent Dietz and Lieutenant Gary Roller checked the Ohio Law Enforcement Gateway System for owners of silver Toyota Yaris vehicles in Knox County and pulled up one photo that looked like the man on the video at Walmart. The man was Matthew Hoffman, and he had renewed his driver's license on October 26th, only 16 days earlier. So when Hoffman had his driver's license photo taken, he was actually wearing the same camouflage shirt as the man on the Walmart video. So investigators checked the Knox County website, looking for Hoffman's address. The first listed was on Apple Valley Drive, within walking distance of King Beach Road, and then the other location was on Columbus Road in Mount Vernon. They also checked for a criminal history, and they learned about the theft and arson that he had committed in Colorado. So as they were getting more information on Hoffman, investigators spoke with the deputy who had found Tina's pickup truck. The deputy told them that he had confronted a white male who was sitting in a silver Yaris nearby at the same time that the pickup was found. So detectives learned that Matthew Hoffman had told that deputy that the reason he was sitting in his car was that he was waiting for his girlfriend, Sarah, to get off work at the Kenyon Inn. Hoffman had also said he didn't know Sarah's last name because they'd just started dating. And now they found a record that Matthew Hoffman had been involved in a domestic violence issue with his live-in girlfriend, and that was only a few weeks earlier on October 24th. So because of all the information they'd found, a search warrant was requested for Hoffman's house. Yeah, detectives went to the house where Hoffman's ex-girlfriend was living. She confirmed that Hoffman was living at the house on Columbus Road and not at his mother's house in Apple Valley. With the new information, police knew that Hoffman was living at the Columbus Road location. A Mount Vernon Emergency Service Unit van proceeded to Hoffman's house to do a dynamic entry. Now, a dynamic entry is where you use a battering ram, break down the door. The ESU van pulled up in front of the house and officers climbed out and positioned themselves at the front door. This was a no-knock search warrant, so they didn't have to announce that they were there. They used the door ram to force their way in and used a flashbang in the middle of the living room. The flashbang seemed to have little effect on Hoffman. He sound asleep on the couch and didn't immediately comply with the police. So he was pinned to the floor, handcuffed and removed from the house. So the house was searched, and when they reached the door to the basement, it was blocked by a cabinet. 
They moved the cabinet and went down the stairs into the basement. And at the bottom of the stairs, there was a doorway to the right and a person lying on a sleeping bag on top of a pile of leaves. So, of course, this was Sarah, bound with duct tape and rope. And she sat up and looked at the officer. So he had put a plastic bag with two holes in it over her legs like a diaper, so she just had to lay there and pee herself. And her hands were so duct taped that they were just like little paddles, so she couldn't really do anything. So when she realized she was being rescued, she would say later that was a moment she would always remember. She recalled hearing someone come into the house, and they yelled, get down, get down. Then they came downstairs. She saw the helmets on them, and then she knew it was the police. So photos were taken of Sarah to record how she was found, and then she was released from her bindings. Sarah was wearing a white plastic bag, and she had brown cloth gloves on her hands that were duct taped. So her hands and ankles were also tied up with rope. Sarah's first words to officers, and this makes me want to cry, were, I have to get to school. <laughs> it's just so innocent. So despite all that had happened to her, Sarah was afraid that she'd be in trouble for missing school. A detective asked her if she knew where Tina, Cody, or Stephanie were, and Sarah said she didn't know. But she said that she thought the man who had held her captive had also killed her dog. Spot on. Yeah, so Sarah didn't know Hoffman, and she was sure she had never seen him before, so she couldn't think why her family had been targeted. She had a hard time adjusting to the daylight. She'd been in almost total darkness for so long, and Sarah told detectives that she and her brother had been attacked, right after entering their home on Wednesday when they got home from school. She told the investigators that she and Cody saw blood on the tile, and within seconds the man had attacked them. She also said that the man wouldn't tell her what had happened to her mother, her brother, or Stephanie, but now she'd had enough time to think about it, and she suspected that he'd killed them all. So in Hoffman's house, there were bags and bags of leaves stapled to the walls, and there were loose leaves on the living room floor. Police also found a blackjack and a large hunting knife. The so police believed that dead bodies could have been hidden in the pile of leaves in the living room, so they poked in the pile with a stick. It was just leaves. So they also considered whether Hoffman had hung the bags of leaves on the walls to muffle sounds from anyone outside but it seemed that he was just obsessed with trees and leaves. I don't know if he was really thinking that clearly to muffle sounds, because his behavior, although he did try and cover it up and certainly knew what he was doing, was still erratic and strange. Yeah. So Sarah was assured that Hoffman was in custody and wouldn't be able to hurt her again. She was worried that Hoffman had an accomplice, though, and she was assured that even if it was true, she'd be protected now and nobody could hurt her but the investigation would find that Hoffman had acted all alone. Although it was really hard to convince Sarah of that, she was so sure that there was someone with him. So Sarah had been saved on Sunday morning and she'd been abducted on Wednesday. Greg Borders was called and told about Sarah being recovered and Sarah was told by authorities that her uncles, Tina's brothers, had arrived at the hospital and wanted to see her. But Sarah said all she wanted was her father, Larry Maynard. Hoffman was questioned, but he wouldn't speak, and at one point, he pointed to his heart and gestured that his heart was broken. As a sociopath, Hoffman didn't show any signs of anxiety, and the prosecutor offered him a deal where the death penalty would be taken off of the table, but he would have to give a complete confession and tell them where he had put Tina, Stephanie, and Cody's bodies. Yeah, Hoffman claimed that the crimes at Tina's house were the result of a burglary gone wrong. He said that he chose the house because it was isolated, with no neighbors close by. And he did admit to watching the house the night before. And when he saw Tina leave the house in the morning, he walked over to the house and crawled in through the broken garage door. He had made himself comfortable and was spending a long time in the house. Over an hour later, Tina returned home, and that's when she entered with her groceries and Hoffman attacked her. He hit her over the head, he said, but she wouldn't go unconscious. But while all this was happening, Stephanie sprang headed over to Tina's to take her to look at apartments. Though as she entered, Hoffman surprised, and he stabbed Tina several times in her bedroom, 
before he chased Stephanie into Sarah's room, and once in Sarah's room, Hoffman stabbed her to death. Then he dragged the two bodies into the bathroom to dismember them in the tub. And, oh, by the way, he also killed the dog and dismembered the dog. So, he told them a couple of hours later, Sarah and Cody arrived at home, although he never had an explanation for why he didn't leave the house. So this is when Hoffman killed Cody and restrained and kidnapped Sarah. He said he dismembered Cody and then bought trash bags. Hoffman did finally tell police where he had hidden the bodies of his victims. He had put them in a hollow tree at the Kokosing Nature Preserve. And I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing that wrong. I probably am. But this was an area near Kenyon College. This tree was over 60 feet tall, so he'd actually set up a pulley system to get the remains into the tree. This is a very remote, heavily wooded area where the police would probably never have found the remains on their own. He went to some lengths to conceal the, the remains. I know. And that's kind of incredible. It is, but you know, that's the kind of thing he liked. Yeah. So he probably used his climbing gear and pulled it right in there. Yeah. Thinking he was really smart. So the police didn't let Hoffman go out to the area with the police, but he gave them directions to the site. And at the tree, there is a knot hole about seven to eight feet off the ground. One of the investigators climbed up and looked through the knot where he saw black garbage bags. So a tree surgeon was called and he cut squares down from the knot hole area. Then it was just a matter of lifting heavy bags out of the tree and carrying them down the ladder to the ground. Looking in the bags was a horrible thing that investigators who were there would never forget. Of course, I can't imagine how you can do that job. And I always think, how do they sit and talk to these guys? Yeah. I don't think I could sit and have a civil conversation. So I'm impressed that they're able to do that. Now Hoffman requested that the police bring him photos of the tree to assure him that the tree was okay. So he's showing more concern for the tree than for the lives he'd taken. Or what he'd put Sarah through, for that matter. Pretty weird. Very. So he was given life in prison with no chance for parole. Sarah went to live with her father, Larry Maynard, his wife Tracy, and their two children. Larry seemed supportive of Sarah and appeared with her on the Today Show and the Dr. Phil Show. But in 2013, the father and stepmother were accused of beating Sarah in two incidents at their home. According to court records, Larry punched his daughter in her back on May 3rd, and five days later, Tracy kicked her down a set of stairs. So Sarah notified the police and children's services that she was in fear for her life after several abusive incidents and threats to kill her. Plus, there are guns in the house. So yeah, what, so who would have thought? Yeah. I mean, everything I'd read about Larry and I'd seen him on the Today Show, he seemed like a normal father. So. Well, I'm sure that there was a lot of sequelae from Sarah being abused sexually. I mean, she must psychologically have been a mess. Yes, but and beating I, her wouldn't help. I know. I know. I know you know, but I'm just saying. She needed therapy and love. Yeah, not... Not what they did to her. So both Larry and Tracy were charged with misdemeanor domestic violence and assault charges, and a protection order was put in place for both of them to stay away from Sarah. So Sarah moved in with her maternal grandmother, Barbara Hermann. Prosecutors and Sarah agreed to drop the charges after they completed court-ordered parenting classes and a psychological assessment well, yeah, because by then, Tracy and Larry had another child, so they had, I think, two sons who had to be taken out of the home for a while. Yeah. Yeah. No, and Larry Maynard also agreed not to fight the transfer of Sarah's custody to her maternal grandmother. Yeah, so I think we've rightfully been focused on the traumas to Sarah and her family, and of course, Stephanie and her family, but I think we'd be remiss if we didn't mention Hoffman's strange obsession with leaves and trees. It's just a very bizarre thing that I've never heard of before. I don't think most people have. I don't think there's ever been a case like this. No. So forensic psychologists have said that this obsession was an indication of mental illness and delusion. Dr. James Allen Fox, who has written several books on serial killers, said, If trees gave him comfort at all, and were familiar at all, that would explain why he would put the bodies in a tree. But would it? I'm not sure. I'm just re telling you what Dr. Fox said. <laughs> I know, but I don't really understand that. 
I mean, overall, psychologists have called the obsession unique for many other convicted murderers. Yeah, one psychologist described Hoffman as having elaborate delusions related to trees, what trees produce, being in and around trees, and putting people in trees. It's even been suggested by more than one expert that Hoffman would have gone back and visited the tree where he put his victim's remains if he had not been caught. I think so. I think he probably would have climbed up that tree and sat there. Yeah. So creepy. So dendrophilia means love of trees, but the term can refer to people being sexually attracted to or sexually aroused by trees, and this can even involve sexual contact with trees. Ouch! Yeah. <laughs> that bark. But we don't have any evidence that Hoffman wanted to have intercourse with trees. No. Actually, that would have been much preferred to what he did do with leaves and trees. Good point, Dickie. Yeah. So, quite a story. An unreal story. Really? But a story of survival, at least. Yeah. Of one person. So she's uh, in her 20s now. Yeah, I think she's 25. And she has done some recent interviews. So she seems like she pretty much has it together, although it couldn't have been easy. Oh, God. I know. So before we move ahead with feedback, I'd just like to take a minute to update everyone on our members-only show, True Crime Brewery Premium. So listeners who support TCB by subscribing to our premium feed really are an essential part of our show, covering much of the costs of producing our shows. And to keep things simple, every subscriber is on the same level and receives ad-free versions of all episodes, a bonus members-only episode at least once a month, and a gift with a handwritten thank you note. There are options to pay monthly, quarterly, or annually, and we will love you all the same no matter which one you choose. TCB Premium has been up and running for over four years now, so you can listen to both our new and old episodes ad-free. I just wanted to make sure you know about that. So if you enjoy having TCB in your life, you dislike ads, and you enjoy getting gifts in the mail, please consider subscribing. You can do that at our website, tiegrabber.com. And Dick, I wondered if you'd like to give a little preview of what's coming up in our August Members Only episode. Sure, we're going to tell the story of a doctor. We just like to do those stories. Yeah. And this is a doctor who had been expelled from residency programs where he was learning to be a pathologist. And he took it personally that uh, the people who were his teachers had it out for him. So he decided he's going to kill him. So a revenge. So a revenge killing. He killed four people before he was captured. Right. So this guy's a real something to talk about too, right? He is something. Yes, he is. Yeah. It's time for listener feedback. Okay, so let's listen to a voicemail from Jamie with some comments and suggestions. Yeah, Jamie covered a few different areas here. Good girl, Jamie. Hey, Jill and Dick. It's Jamie from North Carolina again. I know you guys wanted to have a little bit of discussion about some of the cases you covered, but man, what can you say about the Sandra Cantu story? Uh, it did open up a little discussion in your Facebook group. I don't know if you saw that, um, but there's a, a few people who are talking about how we've noticed um, children whose parents don't really seem to know where they are and doesn't seem to be a big deal. And they wander around talking to strangers. And it's so sad and scary because like we saw in this case, it can even happen from people who you would never in a million years expect. So yeah, be careful out there, everybody, and, and take care of people close to you. Um, with that being said, I also had a couple of ideas for some cases. Uh, I know right now for various different reasons, uh, a lot of people in uh, the United States at least and other parts of the world too are, are really struggling mentally uh, with just different events. And uh, it, it might be nice to have something that's uh, maybe a little bit, man, you can't really do uplifting with the true crime podcast, right? But I was thinking of some stories that are true crime, but maybe have a, a happy ending at the end, like a plot was foiled or something. I started looking them up, but then I figured you guys have had so many case suggestions over the years that I'm sure you have at least one uh, somewhere in your spreadsheet there. Uh, another idea I had too is the story of Michael Malloy. 
That one's not really light or uplifting at all, but it was 89 years ago. So there's a little bit more uh, time separation there. So that makes it easier to uh, take in. But man, that's a rough one. Uh, some crazy stuff happened. And I've heard a few other podcasts cover it, but it's mostly a uh, history podcast that I've heard it from. And they cover the historical aspects. Uh, most recently, Scoundrels did a great job covering you know, the times that made that situation. It, and that's great. But I haven't heard anybody cover it um, with medical expertise. Like, I think both of you could do a great job at it. And I'd really like to hear that side of things. And to my knowledge, though I don't know everything yet, uh, nobody's done it. So uh, that's just another suggestion, too. Anyways, uh, thanks for all you guys do. Thanks for uh, keeping us entertained. And I can't wait to hear the next episode. I uh, hope you guys are doing great. Have a wonderful rest of the week. Thanks. Thank you, Jamie. So yeah, the uplifting thing is difficult. I think with most cases, if someone survives, like in this case, Sarah Maynard, we try and concentrate on, you know, the positives of that, how someone can survive and have a normal life. I don't know how uplifting that is, but it's something. But well, yeah, I, I would just echo that. And this young lady could have been psychologically damaged for life. Oh, well, yes, I'm sure. But she's managed to come through. Yes. So, good for her. Well, and she could have been killed like the rest of her family. She could have been. So, it really is close to a miracle that she did survive because I have no doubt in my mind that he planned on killing her when he was done getting whatever jollies oh. he got out of this. There's no question. Yeah. So, I think that she was definitely in a position to be murdered. And just a few words about the Sandra Cantu situation. Yeah. I have uh, experienced things like that. Back when I was raising my children when they were young, there were neighbors who would just kind of let their kids run throughout the neighborhood. We'd had this one little boy who would come down the street, and his parents seemed like intelligent, normal people. But come by on a Saturday morning, I'd feed him lunch, he'd hang out, it'd be time for dinner, I'd be calling their house. They'd even, uh, I'd see them drive by going to run errands. So I'm not sure what that's all about. But it doesn't seem wise to be letting your children just kind of run wild, for one thing. It's dangerous. So, yeah, I can see that. And with Sandra, I just think it's people being naive. I don't think that the parents were purposely negligent, but just seem naive to the dangers out there, really, which is very sad. But this Michael Malloy case, very interesting. It's been a while since we've done something, you know, before 19... 90 even, or 1980. So this is 1920s and 30s. Yeah. I would love to do that. So I'm going to look into that. Well, let's check it out. Okay. I mean, the thing with Michael Malloy, this this was a guy who had been a fireman and uh, at the time of his death was a homeless alcoholic in New York City. And he had these friends, loosely named acquaintances. They decided, you know, let's take out a life insurance policy on him and kill him for the money. Wow. Except that this guy, Malloy, was indestructible. He, he survived at least five attempts at his murder. And they finally killed him by having him pass out from drink and putting a hose in his mouth attached to a car. And he died of carbon monoxide poisoning. Well, you're right, Jamie. That is not uplifting in the least. But it does sound fascinating. Yeah, and it's 90 years old. Yeah, I like so. that. Okay. Okay, and I'd also, we had a, a fair number of voicemails, so I, I just couldn't play them all, but I did want to say thank you to Tammy, Stephanie, Dale, Monique, Pam, and Barbara. You all had incredible voicemails. Thank you. Yeah, so these were mostly, they had a lot of praise in them that we just don't think other listeners care to listen to that much, but we appreciate it. We do. Yeah, and if anybody that sent in a voicemail, any of you, want to get the bottle opener even though we didn't play it, we'd be happy to do that. Just send us your address. Got it. Yeah, because I ordered a thousand of them. I have many bottle openers now. Okay, so we do have a couple emails. A couple emails. I was a little slower this week with the feedback just because I was told by my wife that the episode itself was fairly long. <laughs> so I, I didn't do a lot of feedback. We have the one voicemail and a couple emails. Yeah, we don't usually do a lot more than that, but okay. So I'll read the first one. This is from Gina, and it's a case suggestion. Gina says she loves our podcast, and she thinks we'll want to cover this story. This triple homicide happened in her hometown. So she writes, The killer was a local Pee Wee football coach, 
and pretty visible in the community. It is a brutal murder of his ex-wife, her boyfriend, and child with a hatchet. And he did this with three other kids in the house, and then took two of those kids with him for donuts. Sick fuck. All right, we haven't had an F-bomb in a while, so that's good that she sent that. <laughs> so, <laughs> Gina, this, Gina did it for you, Jill. She did it. So in June of 2000, Larry Gapin broke into his ex-wife's home and killed her, her boyfriend and father of one of her children, and one of her kids, and he was convicted. But there must be more to that story, and I'm going to find there out. There is. This is the uh, Cliff Notes version. Okay, great. So thanks, Gina. So, and then we have a case suggestion from Kaisha. Okay. And she says, I'm a huge fan, have been listening for years. I love the podcast and the medical psychological piece you guys add to it. I'm a nurse, and it is always interesting to hear that part. And she has a recommendation or two. So <laughs> You're skipping stuff, but okay. Some was, nice praise. You're I was skipping. editing it. Okay, go ahead. I'm sorry. So one suggestion was the case of Sarah Stearns. She doesn't think we've done, and we haven't. She was a 19-year-old from New Jersey who was murdered by people that she thought were her friends. Uh, all a very callous and calculated murder that had been planned over a period of six months. Her friend, or the murderer Liam, was recorded giving a detailed account of what happened to her and why he did it. And it's, it's a chilling story I couldn't not share with you guys. And then the second recommendation, fortunately this woman didn't die as a consequence, but it's still rather interesting. And this is the story of Amber Smith, who was found in a park near her home, bound, beaten, and raped. This crime went unsolved for years, and Amber ultimately tried to put it behind her and move on. She went on to live with a group of guys as roommates and was able to call them her family. In the years after she moved out on her own, one of those guys that she roomed with had his DNA added to the system on an unrelated issue and came up with a match as her rapist. Wow. That's quite a story. Is that a story? Yeah. So the interesting part is she didn't meet this roommate until after the crime. Well, that's creepy. It makes you wonder, did he purposely seek her out? Yeah, did he insinuate himself into that? Yeah, right. She spilled her heart to him and told him her story and her pain, and he supported her and became one of her closest friends in their little group. The entire time he was her rapist, had left her for dead, and then he went on to be her friend. Crazy world we live in. Kaisha says, I listened to this story on Dateline, and the episode is called Left for Dead. Okay, I am going to go watch that Dateline episode as soon as I can so, find it. So we got some good stuff to look at. Those are some great recommendations. Aren't they? Yes. So thank all of you very much. We really appreciate your listening and all of your support. We hope everyone has a good week. And we'll see you next time at The Quiet End. We'll save a seat for you. Bye-bye. Bye, guys.